It's lovely to see you all uh, and welcome to this, our foreign policy and politics session of the 2023 Japan Update. My name is Amy King uh, and I'm a fellow at the Australia Japan Research Centre uh, and a member of the Coral Wells School of Asia Pacific Affairs here at the ANU. It's wonderful to be chairing this panel uh, session this afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and to pay my respects to elders past and present. I think it's fair to say that it's been an extremely eventful year in Japanese foreign and security policy. In December, Japan released the National Security Strategy, National Defence Strategy and Defence Build-Up Program, which together detailed Japan's plans to respond to a security environment which it deems to be the most secure, sorry, the most severe, not secure, <laughs> the most severe and complex <laughs> since the end of World War II. It perceives that security environment as being particularly challenged by North Korea, by China and by Russia. In response, the Japanese government plans to expand its military capabilities, including by acquiring a counter-strike capability, and to increase, increase military expenditure from its historic limit of 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP by 2027. Japan's external strategic relationships are also changing. Although the alliance with the US has remained central to Japan's foreign policy strategy, Japan has made significant uh, efforts to increase its strategic cooperation and military interoperability with a range of partners, both in the region and further afield. In the past year, Japan has signed reciprocal access agreements with both Australia and the UK, has committed to expanding its strategic relationships with India and Italy, has plans to establish a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN, and has initiated a new official security assistance policy which will fund and transfer military equipment and weapons to like-minded countries. Japan's understanding of the deeply intertwined relationship between economics and security is something that goes back to the Meiji Restoration and has shaped Japanese policy and foreign relations fairly consistently since then. Perhaps for this reason, Japan in 2023 continues to be at the forefront of global efforts by countries trying to knit together their economic, technological, industrial, foreign aid and development and national security strategies. Over the last 12 months alone, Japan has taken steps to fortify itself and its regional partners against economic coercion, to strengthen supply chain resilience in critical materials, and to more proactively align Japan's provision of official development assistance more closely with its wider national security and foreign policy goals. So there's been a lot going on. And to help us think through these and many other issues, I'm delighted to have an all-star panel joining us today. I won't provide extended biographies of our panelists. Their achievements are many, and uh, their biographies can be found in the program. But let me please welcome Soya Yoshihide, Professor Emeritus at Keio University, Mia Oba, Professor of International Relations at Kanagawa University, and Mike Green, Professor and CEO of the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. I'm going to ask each of our panellists to speak for about five to seven minutes in turn on key issues in Japan's foreign and security policy over the past 12 months. We'll then open up to questions and discussions, both from the audience as well as from our live stream. So Yoshihide Soya, turning to you, you've recently co-chaired, and I'm going to show this off, a major report uh, entitled Asia's Future at the Crossroads. Could you tell us a bit about the nature of that crossroads and how Japan is positioning itself in the face of it? Thank you, thank you, Amy. Uh, it's good to share this panel once again. Uh, as I checked the past history of this update, I, I was invited in the second uh, yeah, update. And uh, Shiro-san has been very kind uh, since then. Uh, I really appreciate your friendship and professional kind of contact. And, uh, well, the re I'm not here to publicize my report, but uh, I, I will basically talk about why uh, I dis decided to sort of work on this and the kind of a sense of problem that I have. And uh, allow me to start from there. And it may sound a little bit critical about the current sort of state of Japanese government approach to uh, traditional security, but uh, it's a uh, intellectual criticism. Uh, Policy-wise, I support it, uh, but, but partly. And uh, the point is, 
if this is everything, uh, we are perhaps in the course of collision course, uh, and uh, and we cannot, you know, move from the region. And I don't like war between China and the United States, and uh, therefore, how to avoid this, you know, this sort of worst case, is is also very important. But the, according to the current paradigm, so to speak, of the government. Uh, only one sort of uh, uh, preparation for this uh, worst scenario is deterrence. Deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. And, uh, and deterrence is, of course, important. And the preparedness in the traditional sort of power politics, of course, very important. But the more important thing is what to build upon those foundations. I think that is a key to the second set of problems that I just raised, which is how to avoid this you know, uh, kind of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, coming to true. And, uh, and if deterrence works, of course, uh, it, it would be a happy ending. Uh, but uh, of course, there is, there is a worry uh, about this collision course, uh, to be frank. And uh, economically and otherwise, this is a tragedy, a catastrophe for everybody, including the Chinese, of course. And uh, so that was a sort of problem, sense of problem that I had. And from this perspective, uh, uh, our take or analysis, so to speak, of the current existing document is as follows. It's a paradigm shift, really. You know, the, the, the framework is, is, it represents uh, virtually a paradigm shift of Japanese security approach in several dimensions. The so-called post-war Japanese framework of security defense policies. Number one, we virtually stepped down from the stage of power politics. You know, there was a sort of self-conscious kind of determination uh, among the government people and, and the security analysts as well. The post-war Japan cannot directly play power politics. And number two, uh, defense preparedness is justified in the name of Tosenshu uh, Boe, a strictly defense-oriented you know, uh, approach, and Kibanteki uh, Boe which is basic defense force. That was the concept. But in the current document, uh, these two are totally changed. Document is facing current security environment squarely and talking a lot about balance of power, power politics, geopolitics. And secondly, it says the core of Japanese approach is its self-defense capability. And the document explicitly says, we do not subscribe to the previous you know, basic defense force concept. New concept is concept of required defense force. It's, the document says explicit. So it's a, as a concept, it's, it's a paradigm shift, really. And uh, so it's important, very much important. But we don't see much debate among the Japanese. The reason may be, you know, international environment, security environment may be that difficult. So there, there is such an air, so to speak, which covers not only Japan, but every, everybody perhaps in the world today. And, uh, but lack of debate, I think, is intellectually problem, of course. If paradigm is perfect, of course, everybody should welcome it. But I think it's, it's only partial. Effectiveness could be partial. So our interest is, is, is again, uh, what to build upon this. And uh, so this, this is not arguing against my, my green. Uh, you may not like it, so I'm not going to I'm not going to give it to you. But but anyway, uh, anyway, what to build upon this? Uh, you know, on, on, on the kind of things which Mike is working on. You know, so it's complementary. To be frank, that's that's my take. But anyway, so so that's a sense of problem. And uh, if things move on this track, I think Asia will be divided eventually. We don't like to be pushed into the corner where we have to choose between US and China. That's what ASEAN people say. I think most of, most of Asian people say that. And I think Japan should be the same. We don't want to be pushed in that very end of the corner. 
where we have to choose between U.S. and China. If choices are is there, of course, we're going to choose U.S., no problem, I, I, no question. I think that's the attitude of many, but if not all. Uh, so Asia may either be divided or will be in a catastrophe. So continuing to tread on, on this course, I think, and without really serious public debate, uh, I think that, 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 that's a problem. And so that's the nature of this report. And uh, I've run out of my hard copies, so if you're interested, if you give me my email address, I will send you P PhD file of this. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm serious. So, well, so, so what's the substance of this? And of that for the lack of time, I, I will just present my pet theory of sort of middle power cooperation. And what, you know, I sometimes use the term squeezed middle between US and China. So effective cooperation among the squeezed middle. I think that's, that's what we, we are aiming for and what, is, what has been terribly lacking in our region. And Japan-Austria relationship is very important from this perspective to me as a cooperation between squeezed middle. So that's a strategic position, conceptual position that I have you know, between US and China. In reality, we are on the side of the U.S., of course. And, uh, but the conceptually, sometimes it's useful to think that you are just in between. And uh, that you know, gives up a kind of a new horizon in thinking about potentials as well as problems. And uh, the last thing that I want to say is about South Korea. You know, from this perspective, South Korea is terribly important. And the lack of effective cooperation between Japan and South Korea is a huge loss, huge opportunity cost for the entire region, not only between Japan and South Korea. And if Japan-South Korea relationship gets in shape, then I'm dreaming about a time when effective actual cooperation among Australia, Japan, South Korea, you know, uh, taking some shape. I, I have my pet idea, but I, I don't have time. So in, during discussion, if you know uh, there is a time, and uh, I think these kind of efforts were terribly lacking as a concept in the current report, uh, I mean government document, and even among debates, uh, among experts in, in the debates about security and national policies. So those things are in my report. So if you are interested, give me your email address. So <laughs> thank you. I will finish here. Yeah. Thank you. Mia Oba, as Soya Sensei has, has remarked, um, that, well, and that's, exa that's precisely what we'll come to, particularly because as 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of Japan ASEAN friendship and cooperation, and, and you have recently chaired yeah. the government's expert panel on this relationship. And I guess I'm curious to ask you how that long standing Japan ASEAN relationship is changing given what we've just heard about all of these new developments in Japan's yeah. own kind of paradigm shift in, the, in, in terms of its foreign and security policy. Yeah. And I guess in particular on this question of, you know, we understand the long standing view within ASEAN of, of yeah. wanting to avoid choosing sides between the US and China. Mm -hmm. Is this a view that Japan also shares? Mm -hmm. um, or is this, is this an area where there will be, I guess, a, a a challenge in the Japan ASEAN relationship. Yeah. Be interested to hear. Yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your introduction and the question. And uh, thank you for the uh, AJRC staff and all the all the people uh, who prepare for this big event. Thank you very much. So uh, my specialty is uh, uh, now is regionalism in Asia and Asia Pacific, including the ASEAN. So uh, sometimes I write about the ASEAN and the Japan ASEAN relationship. But before that, so. So I, I studied the uh, development of the Asia Pacific regionalism, and then at that time I focused on the Australia and Japan, and then so Canberra, and uh, I have uh, many many memories in Canberra for my research for my dissertation. But anyway, the, anyway, and then so yes, um, I talked about the brief history, so uh, the relationship between the ASEAN and Japan. So, and the, the starting point of the ASEAN-Japan relations uh, was in the, uh, 1974, uh, 1973, I'm sorry, 1973. So when the Japan-ASEAN so held 
the uh, synthetic liver forum. So it means that so the, at that time, Japan, Japan, Japanese companies and exported uh, synthetic labor. So to the all of the world, it, it uh, provided a negative impact on the natural labor uh, industries in the some ASEAN countries, especially the Malaysia and Indonesia. And then so they tried to negotiate this, uh, this issue with Japan, but so individual so negotiation was not so good for them, and then so they used the ASEAN as a forum to negotiate so with Japan. This is the first time. So it means that it was not so happy starting point for Japan. So at that time, so Japanese and economic uh, power and presence was prominent in the Southeast Asia. Uh, Japan uh, provided a huge amount of ODA into the Southeast Asia and uh, uh, exported trade, exported many goods to, to Southeast Asia. And so a uh, Japanese company began to invest uh, the huge amount of the finance into the Southeast Asia. And then so Japan's economic presence was so big at that time. But on the other hand, you know, Japan has a very negative legacy so during World War II. And then, so that, neg that legacy led to the bad, bad, bad memory about Japan in the Southeast Asia, and uh, such a Japanese big presence in, and economic presence in the Southeast Asia sometimes led to the very string and strong criticism from, from, from the Southeast Asia against Japan. So, for example, in the 1974, Prime Minister Tanaka visited the Southeast Asia, so Jakarta and, and uh, the, uh, Bangkok. So, the, the, they, 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 have, they faced a very big uh, anti japanese riot at the time. <coughs> that, 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 that is a story. So, at the starting point, so in the 1970s, so there was a very big power gap between the Southeast Asia and Japan. And so, uh, Japanese, uh, the Southeast Asian perspective towards Japan, of course, as an economic partner, it was okay. But on the other hand, uh, people in Southeast Asia have assigned a, a kind of the resentment or the kind of the negative image against Japan. So, so Japan have and Japanese Prime Minister Fukuda and had to deliver the Fukuda speech in Manila in the 1977, so which emphasizes the importance of the, uh, the relationship between the ASEAN and Japan. And he also said Japan and ASEAN should be the equal partner. So in the 1977. So, but now in the, uh, the 2020s, so <laughs> the situation is drastically changed. And then, so our, in our uh, expert panel for the ASEAN Japan 50 anniversary, so we uh, held the meeting once a, once a, uh, once a month, so from the uh, last May to, to the end of the, uh, December. So and then, so we have to focus on the how change so of the Japan ASEAN relationship and how change the Japan and the ASEAN. So, and then the, 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 I, and so we submitted the, the final uh, the report, recommendation to the government. So, and then, so of course, it, uh, it was uh, the written in originally Japanese, but I asked Mofa to translate it into Jap in English so you can read it, this one, in English. So if, if you uh, are interested in that, so please access to the uh, Mofa website. You can easily find it. But anyway, so I would like to focus on the, some point. To, to, from my point of view, so and then the first one is uh, um, the power gap. The power gap between the ASEAN and Japan is shrinking. So now the total the GDP uh, in, in 2022, total GDP of the ASEAN 10 ASEAN countries reached uh, maybe two, three point five or six trillion US dollar, and then just Japan, Japan as for Japan, four point two or three. So and then, so the the gap between the uh, ASEAN and Japan is very shrinking. It's a very uh, drastic change than compared to the that situation in the past. The second one is, uh, yeah, yeah of, of course, uh, uh, 
against the, the such a, uh, economic development, so the ASEAN has become to be a more active player, proactive player, and their, their voices become so loud, so in the regional and international scenes. So examples of the last year, so the, uh, Indonesia was a chair of the G20. The, the, uh, the Joko and the Indonesian government so succeeded in the, uh, uh, delivering, delivering the, the uh, uh, joint the communique of the summit and to deliberate the, deliberately the manage the, the G20 so meeting. So and then so uh, it's, a, it's a case. And then so now the ASEAN is not the uh, association of the small, small countries. So now is, uh, is very, it has a very big voices and influence in not only the, in the East of Asia and the Southeast Asia, but also in the world. And the second one is, so Japan's so policy shift. So I want to focus on this one. So and in the past, Japan tried to, or the Japan, ha, Japan had to consider the negative legacy. So with the in the Southeast Asia, and then so they did not want to uh, take the role in the political and the security field. So and then so Japanese Japanese government rather emphasized the focused on the economic cooperation. So with Southeast Asia. So, but now, so especially in the, during the 2010, so since the uh, second Abe era, Abe administration, and the Japanese government uh, tried to promote not only economic cooperation, so, but also defense cooperation, defense cooperation and security cooperation, so with the Southeast Asia or the ASEAN. So, the, for example, so now Japan and Indonesia, and Japan and the Philippines has a two plus two, two plus two framework, and so Japan signed uh, the agreement of the uh, transfer of the defense equipment and uh, technology. So with five ASEAN and uh, five from the ASEAN countries. So and so Japan provided uh, actually provided the patrol ships to the some uh, coast guard. So in the Southeast Asian country like the um, Philippines and uh, 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 Vietnam or the, such as, so, so, so many uh, examples so which uh, demonstrate such a change of the Japanese policy towards Southeast Asia. Of course, economic cooperation is also uh, still very important for Japan and ASEAN, but on the other hand, so Japan, Japan tried to uh, diversify the uh, content of the uh, cooperation with Southeast Asia. So um, then, so, yeah, so, why promoting the why why uh, did and do the, the, does Japan promoting such cooperation? So, um, from my point of view, Japan tried to be the proactive so regional trade promoter. So instead of the very passive so player, so who just uh, be provided by the uh, regional order, so by the United States. I mean. So the, the passive uh, attitude to the very proactive attitude. So and then so now so Japanese Japan Japanese uh, uh, government so emphasizes the rule-based regional order or something. Yes. So and then so uh, at least from their perspective, so the the Japan should be the promoter or the such a rule-based international order. And uh, from this point of view, Southeast Asia and ASEAN country uh, should be the very good partner for that. So, but on the other hand, we, we have to focus on the uh, perspective for the ASEAN. So everybody knows that so just, uh, ASEAN uh, do, do not, ASEAN country, any ASEAN country does not want to take one side. So even though the US and the US and the China library is escalating. So and so I think Japan could not and cannot and will not pull them to us. So but but maybe so Japan tried to get support so from the Southeast Asia as much as possible. And then so they tried to deliberate approach 
to the Southeast Asia uh, 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 depend on the issue base. I mean, issue based. So and then, so for example, so the uh, Kishida administration proposed the Asia uh, Zero Emission Community, so which is very deeply related to the um, energy security and uh, climate change, climate change, or the such a uh, specific project and uh, and, uh, and the, the content. So are the very key ish, key key points. So uh, provided by the Japanese government now, but uh, um, I think. This is my, it's, it's, it's not my own uh, uh, opinion about the current situation in the world, in the region. Yes, many people uh, say that, so decoupling, uh, the risking, or the, uh, the competition between the uh, liberal, uh, liberal world and authoritarian world. So, but that I don't think that the world is, not, uh, world is so simplistic, <laughs> I mean, more, co more complicated. So we are, li we are living in the more complicated world, and ASEAN countries so understand that. So Japan should understand that. So, for example, so we we of course we have many many problems with China. So, but we cannot cut off the relationship with China because China is a very close neighbor of, of Japan. And uh, Japanese companies has uh, many many uh, the production bases and and the market in China. Can you cut it? Cut it totally? Not. And, and so China uh, they never move from the East Asia. So, and then if so, so we have to think about so how to stabilize the relationship with China. And then so maybe so ASEAN country so, uh, think the same thing. So they know much about the, uh, the risk of the over-reliance of China. So, and so China's economic threat. So, I mean, so they, some of, some of their, uh, they, some, of, some of ASEAN countries have a, a South China Sea issue. And then, so ASEAN also understand that. So, and then, so I think, uh, and from this point of view, ASEAN and Japan have the same problem. How to, how to uh, US and China relation uh, compatible one? And then, so I think it's, is, it should be a very long term so issue for uh, no, not only Japan but also ASEAN. So I stop here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. So I, I talk too much. Not at all. That was <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. And just to reinforce that point that if you'd like to read uh, the English or Japanese language version uh, to, to have a look at the MOFA uh, website for that report. Uh, Mike Green, turning to you, and it's, it's again picking up a theme that, that Oba-sensei just, just sort of referred to about Japan perhaps being more proactive, particularly in the ASEAN relationship right now. I mean, for decades, I think, uh, scholars and pundits alike have perhaps unfairly cast Japan as fairly reactive in terms of its foreign policy, a country that doesn't have a strategy. I think that's perhaps a bit of an unfair characterization. But I think it's certainly fair to say that Japan is now more proactively shaping the regional order. Do you agree? And, and if so, who are the cast of characters within Japan that are really leading this uh, and prosecuting that strategy today? Um, thank, thank you, Amy. It's, it's really nice to be here. Um, I looked at the agenda and and was worried I was in the afternoon because I'm so used to US-Japan conferences where either the Japanese delegation or the American delegation is falling asleep at this point. <laughs> and then I remembered, oh, I live in Australia now. <laughs> no, you guys are lucky, no jet lag. Right but it also means if people fall asleep, it's entirely my fault, so. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is an update. And if you were looking at the past year uh, in, in Japan's foreign policy security um, uh, landscape, you'd say it was a year of implementation implementation of the Abe strategy. It's not just Abe's, but Abe consummated it and used his time and power to, to, to put it into practice. But really, the three secure national security documents, decisions on big things like 2% of GDP, GDP defense spending standoff strike, um, this, this is all being implemented now. Um, and pieces that, like Yoshi said, that weren't in Abe's strategy, uh, the Korea part which is really critical. Um, and interestingly, it's being implemented by, um, by Prime Minister Kishida, who's not from the right of politics, he's from the center. And arguably, that's why it's accelerating, because uh, it's, it's an easier sell if it's Kishida. Well, I think you'd also have to give some credit to Xi Jinping, 
for creating uh, urgency and, frankly, Putin, because the impact of the Ukraine war on Japanese thinking, if you look at public opinion polls, is pretty considerable, actually. Um, so I think it's worth focusing on this question you raised, which is, um, uh, does Japan have a strategy? Yes. I just wrote a book on this. It's in English and Japanese, if you want. Um, but, but more importantly, um, I, I would argue that, um, that this strategy uh, for shaping the regional environment is the most influential strategy in the world right now. Um, that, that the approach we're seeing has had more influence on American foreign policy strategy over the last five years than America has on Japan. And I would say the same is true for Australia, for the UK, for India, and for Korea. And other, and other parts of Southeast Asia and Europe as well, and Canada. Um, Abe's sort of left office, there was some controversy, but he had in place an approach to a more contested security environment that creates what in Japanese is called the otoshidokuro, the place where logically other governments that are democracies and maritime powers are going to go. Because it's very logical, and as, as Rick said earlier, with respect to um, economic interdependence on, on China, Japan's been thinking about this longer. My only correction would be it wouldn't be 10 years ago, it would be sometime around the 7th century, but <laughs> uh, Japan has first mover advantage and has consensus. The rest of us do not have consensus in our politics or our expert opinion or public opinion on what's happening in the world. I mean, as Rick pointed out, it's starting to emerge in the US. I think in Australia, it's just starting to form the UK. Japan had an early consensus, and that was part of the source of the influence and thought leadership. Um, you know, the key elements, uh, FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific, um, defining regional dynamics in a broader geographic scope to bring in India for obvious reasons of balance of power and influence. Um, there's an interesting foreign ministry uh, report that I quote in my book. Um, it's in Japanese, but they, they, they try to figure out where did Abe's idea for an Indo-Pacific come from? Um, anybody know the answer? Rory Metcalf, whose office is right upstairs. So I don't know if Rory's here, but well done. Um, so it was defining more broadly the region and focusing on maritime democracies um, and, and external balancing and balance of power with India, of course, with Australia. And then finally, better late than never, Korea. The Quad was part of that um, and um, outreach to NATO. Um, but the second element was really um, uh, the economic statecraft, which has been so critical. And I would argue, and Shiro can disagree with me, but this may be the greatest period of Japan's post-war economic statecraft in terms of effect. Um, you could argue the 80s were bigger because the, the appreciation of the end really fueled a lot of it. But in terms of foresight and strategy, um, we talked earlier about economic security. Um, the only disagreement I would have with the earlier panel, which was excellent, is Japan's economic security strategy is not a result of U.S.-China competition. <laughs> you know, in Washington 10, 12 years ago, METI officials were the first ones going to Congress, Commerce, State Department, saying we need a strategy for critical minerals because China just embargoed exports to us. We need a strategy on Huawei. We need a strategy on investment screening, on infrastructure financing. All of these ideas were planted by METI officials who then if you know US-Japan relations, did that classic METI thing and went back to Japan and told the media, oh, Shohan, I, the Americans are making us do all this. Um, <laughs> it's a little more complicated, um, but not just the economic security. Trade liberalization, when Abe came to power, about 16% of Japan's trade was covered by EPAs and FDAs. 16% according to the US American Chamber of Commerce. It's now close to 85% in about eight years. Um, when Lowy Institute said Japan's the leader of the liberal order in Asia, they're right, <laughs> actually, yeah, particularly as the US has sort of retreated on that front. And then the investment in quality infrastructure and, and all of that. Um, obviously, deterrence, as Yoshi said, 2% of GDP strike, um, more efficient use of the limited resources in the military. But really importantly, um, this is not Datsube Nua. This is not hedging by distancing from the US. The core of Abe's strategy is greater integration with the US. And the, change in Article 9 interpretation to allow collective self-defense. This was a very deliberate decision that when Japan looked at the US and looked at the threats around Japan, you know, is the problem being entrapped by the US in a war or is the problem abandonment that the US won't be there? And the answer Abe had, and I think the public supported him was, we're more worried about abandonment. And so we're going to risk entrapment by getting rid of this um, ban on collective self-defense with the US, with Australia and others. Um, to integrate um, more with the US. So it's not a strategy based on distancing from the US. Um, and for the same reasons, you know, a Japan-Australia strategy, a Japan-India strategy, 
yeah, is this about hedging against the U.S.? Sure. But it's exactly what Washington wants. <laughs> There's not a sort of contradiction now because of the urgency and desperation that the security problems present. Um, and then, very, very importantly, and, 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 and Yoshi and, and Mie both touched on this, a key part of the strategy in Japan is um, seeking a more productive relationship with China. That's exactly, you know, when the LDP put out its report from the National Security Commission last year, right? <laughs> in April tw last year. It was famous because it mentioned strike, 2% of GDP, but the second paragraph says, our strategic objective is a productive relationship with China. You know what the US national security strategy said? Peaceful coexistence with China is not necessarily impossible, which is like it was written by Spock from Star Trek. What does that mean? The, the, so the US debate right now is just not capable of settling on what a long-term relationship with China looks like. Japan knows that answer largely. Um, I think Australia, would as well. So that's also very influential. All of these things are why both Trump and Biden embraced the Quad, used the word free and open Indo-Pacific, um, tried to get an infrastructure financing, um, and uh, it, it is a legacy that's very, very powerful. The question is, I guess, you know, when, when you have this update next year, will it still be moving forward? And there are things that, you know, I could think of that would make it more difficult, including political instability. Um, you know, Australia and Japan have both experienced that one prime minister a year thing. Very difficult to execute strategy, build partnerships. Um, you know, Taiwan in particular, or South China Sea could become more intense, more difficult. Is 2% enough defense spending? Are the changes that are happening enough? Um, and then the economy, although I think we all came away from this morning's panel more reassured on the economy. So there are things that could interrupt this. What I don't see interrupting it is another strategy. I don't see a sort of alternate plan emerging from parts of the LDP or even the opposition. Um, that's why some people are bored studying Japan. But actually, I think it should be really interesting because what it tells you is this is not a bipolar region like Athens and Sparta, where the US and China, the strong do what they will and the weak endure what they must. Powers like Australia, India, Korea, Japan, Indonesia have real agency in Washington and in the region. I think Japan has demonstrated that particularly effectively. Thank you. So in just a moment, I'm going to open up to questions from the audience to give you a moment to think of those questions and to get your hands ready. Um, I'm going to first put a question to, to Yoshida Soya. Um, and again, sort of touches again on just sort of the, the themes brought up by Mike Green there, and in particular that, that point around Japan wanting a productive relationship with China expressed there in the positive uh, f phrasing rather than the, uh, the negative phrasing of the, perhaps the US equivalent. Do you agree with that, that view? And, and I suppose I'd be curious, you know, from, your, from the work that you've done recently, what would be some concrete examples of how Japan might actually develop that more productive relationship with China and South Korea, for that matter? What would look different, in your view, um, in terms of Japanese policies towards two, those two countries, with some specific examples, if you can give them? Well, uh, I want to ask the question from answer from Mike, but uh, I think, I, I wouldn't say it's cosmetic, but uh, economically, we cannot detach ourselves from China, so it's natural that, you know, to, to talk about stable ties with China. Nobody would disagree with that. And, uh, but uh, concretely, as a specific examples, I don't know. Uh, our foreign ministry is trying to approach China, yes, in its own way, but uh, given the current state of kind of emotional sort of you know uh, bad state of the relationship, uh, those initiatives may not work, may not you know get any response, and even this you know uh, process water issue, Fukushima water issue, uh, the story is Japanese side tried to approach China to establish a joint sort of uh, framework among scientists, you know, to, to sort of inform about the so-called scientific, you know, facts. And that kind of initiative itself was rejected by China, you know, uh, according to what I hear. And uh, so there is a statement to that effect, yes, in our documents. And that's not bad, of course. But uh, concretely speaking, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But what I'm more concerned about is, the, as I said, the central paradigm of the new approach. 
which makes China virtually an enemy, or at least a long-term concern, naturally so. And uh, many things were sort of you know, wrapped up uh, on the basis of this. Yeah. And uh, when people say Abe is a strategist, many people used to think in, in terms of Japan's China strategy. Uh, but Mike is suggesting something different here, which, which, is, which is interesting. And uh, you sounded like a Japanese architect of our strategy, but uh, 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 that, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not bad. So, uh, and, uh, so, so that would be the answer to, to, to your question. I have something else to say, but we'll defer. So let's go to questions from the floor. Um, I can see we've got one hand up here we'll come to, and then a uh, woman in green here. Um, so we'll start in the middle section, and then I'll move around the room. <laughs> Oh, that's fine. That, yep, yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you for the talk. I'm Hannah, a student from Australian National University. Um, I have two questions um, addressing a specific person, actually. So I have first question for Mie. So for in your article in the East Asia Forum, you mentioned the rising importance of ASEAN countries and the situation where these countries ask for equality um, as their status has grown. But do you think their like, demand for equality or or a hedging position between US and China will be an obstacle or catalyst for Japan's or Kishida's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific framework? That's my first question. And I have a second question for Yoshi and Michael. Um, Michael, you mentioned the Quad and Soya, you commented that, that if Japan and South Korea relations improve, there's the optimism to build Australia, Japan, South Korea cooperation in the region. If so, since Australia and Japan are in Quad, do you see the possibility of South Korea joining the Quad in the near future? And how will it reflect on Japan's relationship with China, especially the strategy of separating politics and economics, but thank you. Thank you. Mia, why don't we come to you first? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the question. So I'm afraid, so uh, totally I can understand what you said, but, uh, and, and, and I try to reply that. So um, equal partnership uh, is a very, I mean, ideal so word so and then so of course so interspecific uh, politics so the Japan uh, tried to um, uh, promote a more deliberate approach to 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 ASEAN countries so because uh, the, 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 for example the level of the ASEAN countries economic development are diverse so very uh, different so among ASEAN countries. And then, so for example, so the Singapore is uh, uh, the now the developed one of the developed country. And so Malaysia and Thailand and Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, uh, Philippine, so such a countries, so now is uh, uh, succeeded in be better in its, its economy in the globalization and they succeeded the economic development, so high level. But on the other hand, so Cambodia, and uh, the Laos, so uh, the words uh, are the less uh, less developed, and so the Myanmar has a very serious issue. So inside, and then so so on the other hand, and you know, why does Japan have to uh, be the equal equal with ASEAN? But uh, the specifically, the Japan tried to and do the uh, did uh, does the uh, more so flexible and deliberate approach to each ASEAN countries. And then so, but the point is that so Japan is now the not prominent power so uh, towards. Uh, Towards against uh, Southeast Asia, so and then, so for example, so the DX field, so uh, Japan and the South, uh, Southeast Asia, so especially the Singapore and the Malaysia and the Indonesia, such a country uh, should uh, work together, so more equally, and it's the issue, the uh, issue basis. So and then, so and, and anyway, so and we so have to take into account all, all way, always take into account the equality. But on the other hand, we we have to uh, adopt so more deliberate approach to the each ASEAN countries. This is my question. Thank you, Mike. Come to you on the Quad and, and South Korea. Yeah, I don't think Korea will join the Quad. I don't think Canada will join the Quad. Um, I don't think the UK will join the Quad. Uh, I think the Quad members 
it took him a long time to arrive on the title, The Quad. <laughs> um, um, but it's not just bureaucratic politics. The Indians in particular don't want to complicate it. Um, and it, it, it points to a, a, a larger, more interesting dynamic. I just have a piece out today in foreignpolicy.com about why there's no NATO in Asia and why there could be. Um, if you look at a rising challenge to the security of everyone in the neighborhood, which China is, even though you know it's also an important economic partner, one rational option would be a collective security arrangement like NATO. But it's not going to happen in the near term, and nobody, including the US, wants it because it, it creates so many other problems. Obviously, interrupting economic uh, opportunity, but it also alienates Southeast Asia. It just it brings nothing but problems. But if things get really bad, you'll want one. <laughs> you will want one. And so I think instead what you're seeing is uh, just as Korea won't join the Quad and Japan won't join AUKUS and Australia won't join the US, Japan, Korea, Trilateral Cooperation Oversight Group, there's just a proliferation of these things. There are about four quads, by the way, uh, in this region. But if you look at them, um, it's becoming a federation of interoperability and capabilities so that um, Korean forces participated in talisman saber in the Northern Territories, doing stuff that they were doing, you know, with the U.S. and Japan trilaterally. So these things build interoperability, capabilities building, um, and it's a sort of federated uh, arrangement, but not a collective security arrangement. And that's, I think, where Korea is going to play, Canada is going to play, how the a Quad and AUKUS will will have a relationship, but it won't be a formalized thing because that would just create more trouble than it's worth. So, Sensei, you've spoken recently about South Korea and the Quad in particular. What is, what's your sense of this? Well, uh, I think the virtue and merit of Quad is the involvement of India in in this multilateral setting. And so chasing away India would be a bad thing. And uh, so that's one consideration. And... But on, on the assumption of this, I mean, India being involved, and we have to try that, continue to try that. I think dominant image in Japan about Quad is this is a framework sustained by the US-Japan alliance as a foundation and involving Australia and India. So US-Japan plus Australia-India. But from... Uh, the perspective of myself and the, and the report. Quad can also be considered as Japan, India, Australia, plus the US. And if you look at the actual agenda of leaders' statements, foreign ministers' meetings, you know, statements, substance, virtually middle power agenda, uh, rather than traditional security agenda involving the US. I think Mike would agree, right? And that would mean, and there is a commonality I mean, here among Japan, Australia, India. And India, India is, of course, by nature an independent country. <laughs> and, uh, but its you know, actual policies at the moment are quite similar to those of Japan and Australia, regional, regional policy, their way of approaching ASEAN and so forth. So on the basis of this trilateral, substance, adding Korea to this trilateral, sub, you know, trilateral framework is easier than adding Korea to US-Japan alliance you know, un under this quad. I think that's one logical way of thinking about the future. And this is exactly what our report is discussing. And of course, actually, what, uh, realizing this involves lots of you know, difficulties, you know, bureaucratic and otherwise. So I think practice, practitioners would, would, wouldn't want to be involved in this. But, but as an intellectual academic argument, I think this is what we present. Can I just and, add? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Well, just a quick, I do agree with that. Um, the Quad was formed uh, after the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004. And I was in the White House and in, in charge of it at the time. And it was the US, Japan, Australia, and India forming a joint naval, primarily naval task force, because these were the four biggest navies in the region, most disposed to and capable of providing humanitarian relief in places like Bandache uh, that were wiped out. So it began as a um, coalition to deliver public goods. And that's what it remains, <laughs> primarily in its, in, its, in, its, in its focus. 
it's also the four most powerful navies in the Indo-Pacific, by the way. So there's that subtle subtext as well. But I think it's very smart that the governments um, have kept the focus on public goods. Um, it, 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 it's needed and it just resonates better with the region. And it avoids hard choices for the four countries and everyone else. Yeah. And there yeah. is no... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a yes. So I, I almost agree with uh, Soyas and the view on the Quad, but I, a little bit different view. So I have a, a little bit different view. I think, from my point of view, Quad is Japan, Australia, and uh, uh, Japan, Australia, or of uh, US. Yeah, US, Japan, Australia, US, and India. So because so Japan, uh, yeah, US uh, allies. So, and uh, US, Australia allies, and uh, Australia and Japan and quasi allies. And then the, there are the three, uh, three trade, uh, the defense cooperation promoting. But uh, India, India is a very yeah, difficult country. So, so, always the three countries have to consider the reaction of the India to keep the Quad, uh, including India. And then, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Quad should set the substance, uh, the, which is very, very preferable to the India. And then, so uh, the, it's, uh, it's uh, dominated by the, uh, the middle class powers, not, not, not the traditional, traditional uh, security. And then, so uh, from my point of view, the three plus India. And the three have to always so consider the, uh, the, the, the preference of the India and then some compromise so lead to the, lead to the substance of the Quad cooperation. This is my, this is I my, have, I yeah. have a sort of different view on this. <laughs> <laughs> we might, we no. might yeah, yeah, pause yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, so, 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 so okay, yeah, yeah, Japan is a, 30, 30, okay, yeah. 30 seconds, very quick. So, <laughs> India aligned with the logic of US, Japan, Australia security cooperation. It's hard to imagine. Mm. I think uh, this will be the last thing which India may want, you know. <laughs> and but but anyway, and that, uh, I just wanted to follow up just on mm. my remark, previous remark. That is, there is a new horizon of new uh, quad opening up. I don't think it's going to be realized. But there was, uh, you know, Camp Quad, uh, Camp Camp David, mm. you know, trilateralism among U.S., Japan, uh, uh, South Korea, and if Australia joins this logic, this is a new quad. Mm. Yeah. I'll stop here. Mm. Reminds me of when I teach on the Quad, the multiplicity of perspectives on this very topic. So I'm going to take a handful of questions now. We had patient gentlemen up here in the back row, um, and then I'll come down here to the, to the front, and then Don Kun, I think you were, up, you were up there as well. Okay, so question up here, yes. Thank you to the panel for your remarks. My name's Alexander Scott from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I was wondering, Professor Green, if you could expand on some of the comments around the national security strategy, uh, particularly as it relates to the acquisition of these counter-strike capabilities, which involves much more interoperability with the US. Do you think this will influence the debate within Japanese politics around the normalization of the Japanese self-defense forces, particularly if we see a return to a Trump administration or a more isolationist US administration in the future? Um, apologies. Um, we'll come to the question down here. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, it's Felix again from uh, Australian National University Research School of Economics. Uh, Japan doesn't want to go to the corner where Japan has to f pick either from China or US. That sounds very familiar to me because four years ago, during the China and US trade conflict, one of the governor in Australia said the same thing to me. And the question I asked was, how? What is our strategy to avoid being pushed into that corner? So that is uh, one of the questions I have to ask to the speakers today. Another one is especially for uh, Oba Sensei. <laughs> um, as you said, the power gap between uh, ASEAN and Japan has been shrinking during these decades. Hmm. Are we creating another China? Sorry? Are we creating another China in Southeast Asia? Ah. Because considering the political diversity during that area, we got a lot of allies, we got a lot of other countries around this area. As you say, maybe take Myanmar as one of the examples or maybe another countries, 
So what will be the possible positive and negative impacts on that? Thank you. Thanks. And we'll come up here to Duncan. Yeah. Uh, Just talk, yep. uh, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tong Gun. I'm doing PhD here at the ANU, and my question goes on to general general audience, uh, no, general p panel speakers on, especially uh, I think so Soya Sensei briefly talked about trilateral cooperation between South Korea, Japan, and Australia. I'd like to hear more details on like some of the policy op policy options possible in the future, and also what is the boundary of Indo-Pacific from Japan? So, because I was thinking that like some of the trilateral cooperation between three countries can happen in like in ASEAN, but also in the Pacific uh, Islands where Australia is currently very interested in. And I just was wondering on whether Japan is also want to, wants to be involved in this region as well. Thank you. Okay, so I think probably questions there for each of our panelists. Why don't we start, Mike, at your end, and we'll work our way down. So on Counter Strike, um, it. it it's a it's a big change um, for most of the um, certainly since the 1980s the US Japan alliance had a division of roles and missions where as the Reagan administration put it the US was the spear Japan was the shield so Japan didn't develop offensive strike capabilities and in the 80s and into the 90s frankly a lot of American officials would have been worried about you know Japan having that capability and, and trapping the US in a fight the big change over the last few years is that um, on a bipartisan basis, there's a consensus in Washington that we want Japan to have the capability. The U.S. wants Japan. I, I, th that would not have been the view in the Obama administration. It would have been a very minority view in the Obama administration. It's now the mainstream view in the Biden administration, a lot of the same people. And it's just because of the, the threat and the challenges. Um, and of course, in Japan, it's, a, it's, it's been around since, you know, when Nakasone was a backbencher in the 1950s, um, he used to wear a black armband in mourning for Japan's sovereignty and, and to criticize the Yoshida Doctrine. And he, he advocated Japan have strike to, to establish uh, a sovereignty. And so it's been around as a debate for a long time. Um, it's not just Japan. Australia's Guided Weapons Enterprise Ordinance, Korean strike, um, and the US Marine Corps, Army are all developing standoff strike because of the, the PLA's threat envelope. The big challenge, I think, for Japan, there's a bit of a production challenge as there is for Australia, supply chains, workforce, um, but the big challenge is really command and control. Um, the, the US is not going to transfer tomahawk technology or other things unless the US, the US military is inside the decision making loop. And Japan and the US, or Australia and the US, do not have joint and combined commands like the US and Korea or NATO. And that gets to sovereignty. So that one's going to have to be navigated. In terms of Trump, the Trump administration loved this idea. Um, and so I don't see it changing if, you know, if, if the Donald comes back. Um, and in general, I just have to quickly parenthetically say, um, although it was not pleasant, I'm sure, for DFAT or PMNC or the Conte or Gamer Show, although it was not pleasant, uh, Japan and Australia managed the Trump years pretty well. And in terms of security outcomes, other than trade, uh, and perhaps in some diplomatic areas, but in terms of security outcomes, got what they needed. Um, it's NATO and Europe that has to worry. <laughs> because the right wing of Republican politics since the 1870s has actually been very pro-Asia and anti-Europe. So, you know, Australia survived this once. If it comes again, I think Australia and Japan will survive again. Um, uh, can I just quick say on how to avoid... Well, can I yeah. just ask one follow-up question on this sovereignty and command and control yeah. issue? I mean, this has been an issue for, you know, for, for decades probably right. in the Japan case, but you know, it has been raised consistently you know, at least since 2015 and, and those, those set of revisions. What needs to happen in order to actually sort those issues out? Do you see that actually happening? So the what needs to happen part is uh, Japan has to implement what they're calling a PGHQ, Permanent Joint Headquarters, which is modeled on, on Australia's Joint Operational Command very deliberately. Um, and they have to stand it up quickly. They're kind of taking their time. Um, and then the US has got to decide, well, who is the counterpart? And it gets rather technical, but um, the Indo-Pacific Command is not the logical counterpart. If, if in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Central Command was not the warfighter. Yeah, um, so, so the command and control relationship also means the U.S. has to decide. And oh, by the way, although it's not the topic of today's conference, so does Australia. And why? Because for Australia, um, so-called warning time has gone from 10 years warning time to basically nothing. And Japan has gone from being in the rear area 
to being in the front lines. And when you're in the front lines and you have no warning time, you can't in a crisis say, okay, guys, we have a crisis. Who's in charge? Who's, yeah. So these are gonna be very, very sort of parallel debates. Uh, and we're doing a big project on this uh, at our center, very parallel debates in Canberra and Tokyo, actually. And a lot of sort of mutual learning and, and, and psychological support. <laughs> and frankly, influencing Washington is, is needed. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, so yeah, it's very hard for me to predict the future. So, but so I think so. The any ASEAN countries, a uh, country uh, can be the another China in at least in near and the middle and uh, in the in the future in the future. So the reason is that so the size of the population. So yeah, the total total uh, the, uh, to, uh, the now is the population size is a double uh, of the China is a double of the uh, the ASEAN total total population, and uh, so some uh, yeah, of course China is also, but uh, some ASEAN country are face and are facing the aging society problem. And then this is a very big problem for them, a serious problem. Of course, Japan, Japan also so uh, face the same problem. And the second one is the political system. So of course, I, uh, maybe you know that some ASEAN countries, uh, democracy is, has a very serious problems. So in Thailand and uh, sometimes the Philippines, so and uh, even Indonesia. So uh, some some countries so has a very serious. Uh, the democracy uh, is uh, the uh, problem. So, in the political system as a democracy, but on the other hand, all country tried to show we are democracy. So and then, so they keep the electoral system. Of course, it has a very serious problem, but they keep the electoral system, and they do not do not want to be the communist party, communist party system like China. And then, so it's a huge gap, so between the uh, uh, the preference between the uh, ASEAN and China. So and then, so yeah, uh, uh, yes, and so I'm sorry, so. Well, yes, that, 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 that's it, yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so, as I said, there was a question on Japan, South Korea, Australia cooperation and the geographic boundaries of the Indo-Pacific in, in Japan's view. It extends to Africa, so <laughs> <laughs> that's what I know. And to <laughs> the Pacific at the other end, I assume. It's in the South Pacific at the other side of that. Yeah, I, yeah. I would think yeah. so, mm. yeah. But anyway, can, can I respond to other, other question? Yeah, the, uh, two points that I wanted to make. Uh, about, uh, I'm not saying the current government security document, national security strategy document is everything. Uh, of course, you know, it's much broader, comprehensive, but the document says this is the core of Japan's overall. So it's a core document in, in, in that sense. So that's a context in which I'm talking about this. And the you know sort of direct assessment of security environments, which are the most severe since the end of the call, uh, end of the war, and uh, and therefore we need to do our homework. And that's how two percent GNP, right? And uh, but even with two percent, even with ten percent, we cannot deal with security environments, you know, alone, right? We have China, North Korea, and Russia these days. So therefore, structurally, this document does not become complete without inserting the United States in between <laughs> Japan's efforts and security environment. And with the U.S. in U.S.-Japan alliance as a core, that's how this document is com comprehensive. So, so we are stuck with the U.S. under this framework. Without the U.S., does, it doesn't make sense at all. Japan alone doing its homework, right? It's, it's so obvious, right? So obvious to everybody. So, so I can see why Mike Green is so happy about this. You know, American strategists are so happy because Japan is now doing what U.S. used to give pressures upon Japan to let Japan do. So we are doing many things spontaneously, you know, because of this framework, because of this new paradigm. So in that sense, we have chosen the United States already, I think, uh, as long as this you know, new government goes. And um, so how to avoid this? Uh, that's what 
our report is discussing. So, <laughs> so yeah, so, because th that domain is critically important, you know, because of this document in many ways, and because of the lack of debate. And uh, so, and so that's one thing. The U.S. feeling this gap of Japan's, you know, construct of, of security strategy. And uh, and question about Japan, South Korea, Australia. Yeah, I have my concrete idea, which I've been advocating for many years. You know, Japan, Australia signed in the first Abe administration. Was it South uh, AXA, right between Japan and Australia? Uh, agreement on cross-servicing and acquisition. Yeah, uh, you know, t it's not treaty, but that, you know, document. And South Korea followed suit during Lee Min Bak government. You know, between Australia and South Korea uh, has more comprehensive virtual AXA. And of course, areas of military cooperation are so-called in the domain of non-traditional security. You know, human security and uh, you know, disaster relief and UN peacekeeping operation and so forth. No elements of traditional military cooperation. Of course, that's impossible for Japan to do, you know, because of obvious limitations. And the Korean ambassador to Canberra at that time was a good friend of mine, former professor, uh, Kim Yong sang Ah, no, no, Kim, Kim, Sorry, sign, sign of getting older. I forget this, this name. Kim Woo Sang, Kim Woo Sang. Yeah, Kim Woo Sang was ambassador, and we are good friends. And he told me, frankly, in a private conversation, before moving on to this, he studied substance of Japan, Australia, AXA very carefully. And uh, to my question, yours is not that different from ours. And he said, yes. You know, if that's the case, Logically, rationally speaking, there is no reason why Japan and South Korea cannot have similar AXA. You know, and we have already templates. You know, two two templates, and you you just translate something from there to between Japan and South Korea, and uh, and I think it's feasible given uh, to my personal sort of uh, argument, I, I, in my personal argument, this should be the next priority agenda between the current government in South Korea and Japan. I think it's, it's doable, uh, particularly given uh, President in, in Sonio, you know, uh, past records, you know, about Japan policy. And then this opens up possibility of trilateral AXA among US, Japan, South Korea, uh, sorry, US, Australia, Japan. And substance-wise, it's not too much. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal, you know, to, to China either. And uh, I think it's feasible. And uh, if there is leadership, and that's, that's going to be a very important kind of record of actual, you know, accomplishment of sort of middle power cooperation. And uh, to prevent the vision of Asia, I think Asian countries should cooperate. You know, Chinese strategy is, of course, divide and rule. You know, so, so we should get together. It's simple. But we haven't done that much I mean, on, on this agenda. And this, this, is, this is how, you know, Japan, Australia, South Korea ties are very important. Not necessarily in the context of what military strategists like to think about, you know, as, as part of deterrence. Conceptually, is not as part of deterrence. It's, it's different. Yeah. Well, we've reached, I'm afraid, the end of our time, I believe, for this session. And I know there's many, many more questions, so I hope you can perhaps buttonhole our speakers in the, in the break after this. But for now, I think we've heard a terrific uh, overview of, of the energetic uh, intellectual uh, underpinnings of Japan's breadth of activity in the foreign policy and strategic space, not only over the last 12 months, but some of the origins of that as well. Um, would you please join me in thanking our three speakers, Mike Green, Mia Obe, and Yoshimi Soya. Thank you.